great to have you on the program. Welcome to CNBC. It's fantastic to see you here in Davos. I want to kick off by asking you just to react to what we heard from President Zelensky there, a very emotional speech, but also looking forward to a time when we could very soon potentially be talking about rebuilding Ukraine. First of all, he focused on uh, the things necessary to win this war so that we can start uh, the renovation process. And in order to win this war, we need more weapons. Uh, we need the uh, financial alliance. I would not even call uh, assistance because Ukraine is just the front line of the free world in this fight against this brutal force, this barbarian invasion that is challenging the entire free world. That's what the president of Ukraine focused uh, in the first half of this, his speech. But then he focused also on uh, these uh, efforts uh, to rebuild Ukraine. It gives us hope. But it also signals uh, to the aggressor that uh, the whole world will not leave Ukraine behind. And it also allows us to hope that this war will end sooner, because they will understand that their plan to divide and conquer the free world failed. Jerry, when you think about what's happened in the last several months, obviously there's been a huge reaction from NATO members as well as the EU and the United States. Were you disappointed by the fact that the EU decided to insert some kind of mechanism whereby countries could pay in Russian rubles for Russian gas? Yes, it's very disappointing that instead of a full embargo on Russian gas and oil, uh, maybe with some transitional arrangement like exceptions, for example, for pipeline uh, imports uh, in those countries that are critically de uh, dependent, uh, at the same time with kind of special duty or some escrow mechanism just to play it fair. Uh, Instead of this, uh, there are ongoing, never-ending discussions how to do it. Uh, they're still paying every day uh, around $1 billion uh, to Putin to continue this war. And they're allowing these payments in rubles. Again, one can say that not paying rubles, in fact, they're just allowing the bank to transfer this money from euros to uh, uh, rubles and then to take it uh, to Russia. So, first of all, it's a sign of weakness. And second, it allows Putin to evade any sanctions. Walk us through how much Russian gas is still flowing through your pipelines, through your infrastructure. Currently, it's around uh, 60 million cubic meters uh, per day. I would say that it's even less uh, that... Uh, uh, the capacity, the book capacity of one of the entry points. Uh, there were two major entry points that were used for Russian transit. Uh, one of them uh, was basically shut down by the occupation forces. Uh, we just told uh, Gazprom that we could not be any longer responsible for the transit through as entry point because of the occupation forces not allowing us to control our infrastructure. Uh, so we suggested that they move the transit, uh, these volumes from this first entry point to this biggest entry point. But they uh, did not do that. Uh, they are not utilizing even uh, the existing capacity on this main entry point. It's a clear sign that they are at war with Europe. They want to put uh, some European countries on their knees. Uh, they shut down uh, supplies to Bulgaria and uh, Poland. They started with easy victims for them. Uh, but it's really important now so that Europe shows solidarity and they do not leave even Poland and Bulgaria behind with such schemes as, for example, allowing European companies to pay in rubles. Yeah. Walk me through this for, in your view in terms of what the EU is trying to do with gas supplies. And I'm not talking about LNG. Of course, I'm actually talking about oil. Um, the idea that we could see European nations going without Russian supplies. Do you think that that is essential to shutting down President Putin's war machine? Uh, it is essential because, uh, again, as I say, uh, he is getting $1 billion per day uh, from his experts of oil and gas and oil products uh, to Europe. Uh, it's more or less about the size of his military budget, uh, so he won't just have money to spend uh, on this war. Also, he will lose his public support uh, that he, unfortunately, is still enjoying in Russia. Um, and the Russians are supporting this massacre of Ukrainians. But as soon as uh, ordinary Russians start feeling that the Putin regime cannot, again, provide some basic food to them, yeah. then they will reconsider. The Putin regime is based on feeding Russians with their smug feeling of superiority over other nations. So, again, that's why the civilized world should just deprive Putin on the, uh, of the ability to do that. So we've essentially, essentially seen over the last six months or so President Putin using energy as a weapon um, as against European allies, um, NATO allies. The United States, of course, has a bit of a different scenario there um, in terms of that division. Um, but when you think about this and what happens next, 
is there a situation in which Ukraine is actually going to be on the losing end of this energy displacement? Because as the Europeans look to diversify, maybe it's not going to happen today or tomorrow, but for example, Germany's now signed a contract with the Qataris for 2024. At some point, less Russian energy is going to be coming through your pipeline, and that means less income, frankly, for Ukraine. Here again, we have a ship pay contract, uh, and if they don't pay, we will go to the arbitration. And by the way, it seems like we will go to the arbitration uh, because they are now paying less than they uh, have to pay under the contract uh, because they say they're not using this uh, entry point. Again, it's because of them, and we suggested an alternative. Uh, so it seems like, uh, first of all, we have this dispute resolution procedure that we have to uh, try, again, to resolve our disputes without an arbitration, but then we go to the arbitration. And it opens a Pandora box because we will also claim more than $12 billion of some unearned revenues uh, that we decided not to claim as a settlement uh, agreement uh, I signed last time with uh, Miller. So now they are reopening this issue. But back to your question, uh, the biggest problem is not even the physical supply of gas, it's the price of gas. Again, prices are eye-popping. So because Russia started, by the way, this energy war, even before Russia started this war uh, against Ukraine. So uh, they... We were talking uh, about it in our interview yeah, yeah. back in yeah. October when I sat with President Putin and I asked him, are you using energy and weapon, which he denied. Exactly, basically. It's a part of his hybrid warfare. So uh, their actions, uh, their abuse of their dominance, by the way, in the market led to some again, record high prices. Uh, now they're even higher because they're withdrawing supplies to the market. And for Ukraine, especially now, given all the de economic difficulties, to buy gas at such prices, it's, again, it's very, very challenging. So yeah, that's that. why we will need some kind of a coordination mechanism or purely financial support uh, from the West to be able to import the volumes. We need to import this winter just to uh, provide some critical utilities to Ukrainians because there are still uh, tens of millions of Ukrainians in Ukraine, more than 30 million Ukrainians. We provide 90% of the heating to uh, Ukrainians. So without, again, winters in Ukraine are severe, as you could see yourself. So they, people need heating, otherwise they may just die. So that, and they cannot pay such uh, high prices, especially now given all the economic difficulties. Finally, before I let you go, I mean, as you know, I spend a lot of time um, with OPEC Plus producers. I've interviewed Alexander Novak, the Russian energy minister, many times, His Royal Highness, the Saudi energy minister, and the UAE's minister as well. And I've pressed um, the Gulf countries again and again on this in terms of their position on Ukraine, on the invasion. Um, they're sticking with Russia, at least for now, within that OPEC Plus agreement. Do you think that they are in danger of being on the wrong side of history as a result of their decision-making process? Because as you're saying, we're talking about people's lives on the line. Yeah, put it very clearly, uh, and I fully subscribe to everything you have just said in the form of, a, of the question, so I can make a statement out of it. Yes, it seems like they are on the wrong side of the history, and they are, they have a vested interest in the economic development of the world, uh, in the sustainability of the world, and Putin is challenging this sustainability. Uh, he's challenging their wealth. Maybe they don't understand it at the moment, but if we live in the world that Putin wants us to live in, there will be no wealth for the Gulf countries. So there will be no access to the civilized world. Again, everything they have been building for years will just disappear. They have to be fully aware of it.